Well, this is, uh, this is going to be different, I think, than what most folks look forward to. When they, when they come to look at a young earth creationist presentation or, or something like that, we, we often come looking for, oh, I, I want to know the, the best evidence. I'm looking for the fossil evidence. Or, or let's talk about geology or the stars. But talking about philosophy usually is kind of like getting your students in a chemistry class to talk about thermodynamics, and you just, <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit tough. I had a student today, that I was, well, not today, but this week, I was lecturing away, writing on the board, and I heard this, ah, ah. I thought, oh dear, <laughs> I've lost one of them, but he, he stuck with us, so it was all right. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I'm, I am often asked, what is the ultimate argument? I am almost constantly asked, Please, give us the ultimate evidence. We need something that will demolish evolution. I need this. I'm talking to my family. I'm talking to my colleagues. Uh, there's a friend at church. Please hand us this perfect piece of evidence because I, I just I want to convince them quickly and effectively. I, I don't have it. I can't give it to you. But what I do want to put in your hands is something that I believe is the foundational piece to every other question we ask regarding the origins issue. If we can get our heads around this, if we can get our, our ideas around this, if you can get your head around this, it will revolutionize the way that you approach this conversation, the way that you engage with your, your colleagues or your friends or your family members or your church members. Now, the question of origins, the question of where did we come from? How did we get started? Any way that you frame this question, it is a topic that both philosophers and laymen have been dealing with for as long as humans have been on the surface of the earth. And, and some really great writers, just, just think of them, Plato, Anselm of Canterbury, uh, Descartes, Einstein, Richard Dawkins, many others. They've attempted to answer these questions of where did we come from and how did we get here? Now, when they try to do so, you need to know that they do so from an agenda. They have a purpose. And that agenda is influencing their answer to this question. We all have a bias. We cannot escape that bias. So to answer these questions, the questions concerning our origins, to answer any issue related to the question of where did we come from, where are we going, how did we get here, it's all going to come out of that bias, that worldview. Now, let me just start out by noting that anything you hear tonight is my fault. I, I will give you pop, proper uh, credit for where credit is due, but please don't take anything I take or anything I say and, and believe that it's the position of either my employer or the creation study group or even the folks here at Second Presbyterian. Uh, you don't need to blame any of them, just blame me. Now, all of the good stuff that comes out tonight, first of all, give glory to God and then give glory to everybody else too. That'll be all right. But if something wrong happens, I will accept the blame for that. Now, first of all, do you know where you are right now? Right in the arm of the Milky Way galaxy, right here? in the solar system that's a part of that galaxy, and right here on a planet that is just the right distance from a star at the center of that solar system, right here on that planet, right here on a continent in the northern hemisphere of that planet, right here in a city in the state of South Carolina, and right here in a building that has a history, a function, a distinct function separate than what it's performing for us tonight, and it just had that function for a long time. Don't you find that a little bit comforting to, to know where you are? I do. It's always good to know where you are. Now, I suspect that you, if you and I talked afterwards, and I asked you, how did you get here? You'd be able to tell me, well, I came down Wade Hampton Boulevard, or maybe I, I came over from 385 and, and in through the middle of town. Regardless, you and I would understand that answer, and the un understanding of that answer would allow us to begin to engage and interact with un one another on a very important level. It is important for many of our interactions that we know where we are and how we got here. 
Now you're already noting that this is a statement of our worldview. A worldview is a set of beliefs. It's an understanding by which we attempt to answer the questions that philosophers for years have called the big questions, the great questions. And the manner in which we attempt to answer those questions or any question about the world around us, the way that we apply that worldview is our hermeneutic or our system of hermeneutics. And we most often hear that term, hermeneutics, in our Christian subculture in relation to a method of squeezing out our truth, squeezing out meaning from God's word. Theologians teach about hermeneutics. Seminary students, they learn about hermeneutics. Pastors, they apply hermeneutics. You and I, believe it or not, use hermeneutics every time we read God's word in a desire to pull out of God's word the meaning, the truth that is there. But hermeneutics is not limited to just studying God's word. Let me give you a, a definition of hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is a theory. It's a theory of understanding and interpretation of linguistic and non-linguistic expressions that stretches all the way back to the ancient Greeks and their philosophies. So this is not a modern thing. It's a way by which we apply our worldview to try to pull out meaning. We are using that meaning here tonight, and we're actually going to apply our hermeneutics tonight. And when you or I or anyone else takes our worldview and applies it to a piece of evidence or something we're observing to squeeze out meaning and truth, we're applying a hermeneutics. So let's do a little test. Now our experience, our education, our social interactions, all of these things that we do on an everyday basis, when we talk with one another, when we interact, when we watch TV, when we go to school, when we listen to our preacher open the word of God to us, all of these things have made indelible impressions on us. And they have not only impacted, but helped form our worldview, how we view the world. And this worldview often comes to us unintentionally. We don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. We don't spend a lot of time choosing pieces to be part of our worldview. It's just there. So I want to illustrate that with a test, if I may. I want to take a quote from one of our founding documents. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What do we mean by that? What is the truth in that? I, and I, I know, I'm, I'm sorry, I am asking you to be very mentally engaged with that question. I know I am. We hold these truths to be self-evident. What does that mean? What does it mean that they are self-evident? Are they truly self-evident? Here's what it means. Here's what that statement is saying as I understand it. Any reasonable person, any reasonable person without the benefit of any other source than nature itself would come to the conclusion that there is a creator of all of humanity, would come to a conclusion and acknowledge that this creator is both normal and knowledge about him is obvious. It would be obvious also, and we would conclude that we are all created equal. We would conclude naturally, without any outside source, that this creator has given us universal and inseparable privileges, and that these privileges are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Is that true? Would we expect anybody to come up with these same truths? I hope you come to the same conclusion I did. The answer is no. You need something else. The authors of this document wrote this statement in a worldview in which it was known or acknowledged or agreed that there already was a creator. 
that worldview was already present. They held to a very specific set of beliefs, and their culture reinforced those beliefs. So when we state that meaning and truth are two separate things, are we saying that they are two separate things because we know that from nature itself, or have we learned that? What is self-evident? Your answer to that is the application, application of a hermeneutic. So you're actually in the process of applying what we're talking about tonight. One more example, if I may. Does anybody know what this is? You recognize it? Any biologists in the crowd or maybe medical personnel? It's a virus. This is a rotovirus. It's a, it's a micrograph, and it's, it's kind of been enhanced a little bit with some artistic skill. Um, but it is a virus, a non-living thing that relies on living things to reproduce. And uh, this is the one that makes us have a lot of those upper respiratory tract problems that we get very often around January and February. Uh, those kind of things that just make us miserable. So it, it, it's a virus. Now, some academicians consider this to be a virus also. Well, not the image, but the idea that the image is giving us. This is a 12th century stained glass window from a piece of a larger window in the cathedral of Poitiers, France. And it depicts the empty tomb. Do you see that now? Maybe on both sides of it you can see the guards that in Matthew 28 it says that when they beheld the risen Lord they fell as if dead. See the guards over there? It is the empty tomb of the Son of God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's, it's trying to present that idea. It's picturing that real event. Now, there are some scientists, there are some philosophers, there are some great thinkers who believe that this idea of the resurrection in our culture is simply a religious belief that was picked up and passed along but is simply mimicked and copied without any requirement of the culture deciding whether it's true or not, it is a virus, is how that idea is passed along. Now, um, Richard Dawkins has proposed a name for this process, and he calls it a meme. So he says, any idea for a supernatural, the ideas that we have for religion, are really just these viruses, these memes. So a meme is simply something that's a self-replicating idea that is spread through culture, and it does so on its own account. Now, the idea of the meme has been largely discredited. Philosophers, anthropologists have said, you know, we, we really have already identified better mechanisms for the transmission of these religious ideas, better, better than this idea of a meme. So Richard Dawkins is really not doing a very good idea. Yet this concept persists. And if you've been on the uh, internet at all, you've noticed that this concept has even changed a bit so that now you have pages of memes where memes are pictures that we're spreading ideas. Now, one of my favorites is Philosoraptor. That, that's his name, Philosoraptor. Philosopher Raptor. I just, that is great. Nothing like speedy philosophy. Most of it's kind of slow to me, but yeah, the Philosoraptor trying to give us an idea. And maybe it's just irony that the inventor of the meme, Richard Dawkins, has now become a meme himself, which he has. So let me ask, are our beliefs just something that have been passed to us because somebody else believed it? Or is what we believe true because it is true? Because it, there is a greater, larger source of truth. That is the basis of my talk tonight. If we want to understand the issue of creation versus evolution, we need to understand that when a scientist is making a truth statement, they're making it from a philosophical worldview and they're applying a hermeneutic. And they have applied a hermeneutic when they have drawn conclusions about the world around them. Okay, so I, I have a confession for you. You ready? Now, I am a scientist. I've been a scientist by God's grace for many years. And I need to tell you something about scientists. We're humans. 
We find what we're looking for, and often we don't find what we're not looking for. So just consider these two different pictures. Did you see them? Did you see the pieces of what was there? What's in there? Was it what you were looking for, or is it something else? Can you see what's there, or do you miss it entirely? Do you see the man standing in front of that picture of a dragon? We often, just you and I, an everyday process, if I'm wandering through the house looking for my car keys, I will miss everything else, the book on the table, maybe the cat running through the room, perhaps whatever it might be, because I'm focused on looking for my car keys. Scientists do the same things. If I'm looking for old age evidence, I will find old age evidence ignoring any evidence of young age because that's what I'm looking for. Let me illustrate this with two examples, if I may. The first was Jocelyn Bell. Jocelyn Bell, back in 1967, was out looking for extraterrestrial life. So she, she helped build and put together this radio field and began looking for signals from space. And she knew that if she found a signal that might be evidence of extraterrestrial life, well, she discovered one. She got this signal that was very periodic and constant. And she knew that most of the signals that we find in nature are not like that. They're random. They're varied. So that must be evidence of life. Was it extraterrestrial? Had she found it? In her own data, she freely admits that when she found this, she wrote on the data itself, I have discovered LGMs. Little green men. And that was great. She thought she discovered extraterrestrial intelligence because that's what she was looking for until she found a second signal. And then a third and a fourth. And all of a sudden, many of these signals started showing up. As she analyzed the data, she discovered she had not discovered little green men, even though that's what she was looking for. She completely missed the fact that she had discovered pulsars spinning stars that send out a radio signal and they're spinning around. And this radio signal, whenever it would pass over our Earth surface, would give us this signal. So even though she was looking for little green men and completely missed pulsars, eventually she was able to discover it. Here's another example. Uh, Dr. Schweitzer is a paleontologist who goes out and digs up Tyrannosaurus rex bones. Now, she likes to cut these bones open. She saws them in very small pieces. And I'm sorry, I should, I should use the word fossil here. Uh, so she would find 70 million year old fossils and carve them with a saw and put them under a microscope because in the process of permineralization, of looking at these fossils and the way that they were fossilized, it would record small details in the bones, which were important to discover things about the animals. Well, every time she cut one open, she, would, she noticed this. They seem to have the smell about them of dead bodies. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, look. Rocks don't smell like dead bodies. Rocks smell like rocks. Fossils are rocks. They shouldn't smell like dead bodies. And not only did they smell like dead bodies to her, they smelled like dead bodies that had been treated for chemotherapy. That's a very specific odor. A rock shouldn't smell like that. So, of course, she reported it. She noted it to her colleagues, most of who were males and old line paleontologists. She said, I smell life coming out of these rocks. So her conclusion, well, maybe there's biological material still there. Her colleagues, they didn't smell anything. Their conclusion, yeah, ignore. Her. Okay, now, two important observations. The most important is this. Did you all know that God has designed males and females differently? Have you all caught on that? Most of you look like you've gotten to that age where that's become a, a, a well and recognized and grateful acknowledgement. He has. We are different. God has given females a heightened sense of smell. They can smell things that we can't. Now, whenever I tell my students at North Greenville this, this is about the time that I also encourage them Young men, this is why personal hygiene is really important. Yeah, because, you know, just because you're pulling up that sock and giving it a sniff to see if it's clean doesn't mean that she can't smell it. And if you're having trouble getting dates, maybe a couple of trips to the laundromat might help out. She could smell things they couldn't. 
Well, everything just continued on until one day she was out in Hell Creek, Montana, taking a femur from a 70 million year old Tyrannosaurus Rex fossil and loading it on a helicopter when it broke open. Now, this isn't an image of that Tyrannosaurus Rex. Well, it's okay, it's actually an artist's conception of that image with an image of the actual fossil of the pictures I'm about to show you. Now, here's what she found inside of that 70 million year old rock. Material that was flexible like you would find on a chicken tendon. Material that under microscopic examination looks very much like a red blood cell. Material under microscopic dissection that came out and looked like red blood vessels. How is this possible? It's 70 million years old. Now, I want to tell you that I am an organic chemist. That means that I specialize in the kind of chemicals that red blood cells are made out of. I'm very, very familiar with the bonds that hold the elements together in this material. If you brought me a vial of blood, freshly drawn, and you handed it to me and you said, now, Dr. Marks, I want you to use all of your skill to preserve this. Okay, I'm going to do that. I'm going to take that blood, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put it in a non-reactive container. So I don't want my container to degrade the blood. So I'm going to find something that's very inert. And then I'm going to put some things in with that blood that I know are going to preserve it, some other chemicals that are going to keep some chemicals that might degrade the blood from degrading the blood. So I'm going to put those in there. I'm not done yet. Then I'm going to put a non-reactive gas on top. So I'm going to keep oxygen away from it. My favorite gas happens to be argon because argon is very non-reactive. It's a noble gas. And it's also heavier than air. So it settles down on top of the blood and pushes all the air away. I'm not done. I'm going to seal it up. I'm going to seal it up so no gas can get in or out. And then I'm going to put it in very, very cold environment, liquid helium. Now, we're, we're talking colder than any freezer or refrigerator you can probably purchase or even thinking about purchase can get it. I'm going to get it incredibly, incredibly cold. But I have to tell you that it is my professional opinion as a chemist, as a trained chemist, that if you came back in a thousand years and I was around to defrost it and pull it out and pour it out for you, I would hand you a vial full of tar, of goo. Because these compounds are just not that stable. They fall apart. Even if you just set them around, they fall apart. The normal processes of time, they'll, they'll just fall apart. So how is this possible? How do we explain this? What hermeneutic, what worldview allows me to explain this? When Dr. Schweitzer was asked, she said, maybe we just don't understand the fossilization process. She's unable to see that the problem isn't the fossilization process. The problem is the time scale. It can't be 70 million years. That's irrational from a scientific standpoint. It must be much less. Well, that's not the only place they found these fragile organic molecules. They've also isolated molecules from a duck-billed dinosaur. Now, this is a protein they found in there, a protein called collagen. And even though this dinosaur or these bones are these rocks are dated at 80 million years, they still find intact, fragile, organic molecules. How is that possible? They've even been found in the bones of the Tyrannosaurus rex. Now, this is the, the um, horn of the Tyrannosaurus rex, and some scientists have found, let me see if I can point to this for you, these osteocytes, which is a very fragile cell, but is responsible for bone growth. How is it possible that this cell has been preserved in an old rock? It makes no sense. So what we need is we need some scientists to go study for us and tell us how quickly these molecules fall apart. So we did. Not a creationist, an evolutionist. Now the evolutionist went and looked at the bones from a rhea. They knew the date of these bones. They knew when, mostly, the bones had been placed in the ground. They did radiocarbon dating on them, and they did DNA analysis of them. 
and they discovered that they could calculate what was called the half-life of the DNA. Now, the half-life is simply the time required for one half of my original DNA to disappear, or to go away, or to fall apart into non-DNA molecules. That half-life was 521 years. Now, scientists all agree that after 10 half-lives, none of the original material should be around. Okay, so just a little simple math here, right? 10 times 521. The oldest possible DNA I should ever find is 5,000 years old. So now we have an option. How old are these fossils, are these bones? Do we use the hermeneutic, do we use the worldview that science has where they're looking for old age, or do we just use the straight data itself, which tells us there's a maximum age for these fossils, 5,000 years. Who are we going to trust? How about the science instead of the philosophy? 5,000 years is the maximum that these bones could be, just based on the DNA evidence. So we are looking at how scientists, using their hermeneutics, are attempting to address these questions. Who are we? Why are we here? What is our purpose? How is truth derived? I want to give you a couple of examples, walk through some statements, and then see if we can see maybe there's a, a better way, a way that you and I can address this issue. Now, like the average person today, the vast majority of scientists are unaware of how much of their narrative, how much of their worldview is part of a larger scientific narrative. If you walked up to your average biologist, chemist, physicist, astrophysicist, evolutionist today and asked them, could you talk to me about the philosophy that's underpinning your worldview, they would say no. They wouldn't have any way to do that. A hundred years ago, they would gladly do so. They could discuss with you romanticism and modernism, maybe even discuss a little bit about existentialism. It was part of their education. It was part of being an educated person, of being able to do that. Today, they are simply unaware. So here's, here's what we're facing. We're facing science who is making truth statements to us regarding origins from people who are unaware that they even are making truth statements or how they're coming about that truth statement. So now, what do we have? We have the option of a bad hermeneutic or a good hermeneutic. It is one thing to have a bad hermeneutic, but it's even more damaging to have a bad hermeneutic and be unaware of it, especially when you're using that bad hermeneutic to make a truth statement or a statement about something that is true. Okay, so let me just put that in something that we're all thinking about. If I say to you that the universe is 16 billion years old, and I'm telling you that that's a truth statement, am I doing that with knowledge of my worldview and hermeneutic? And if I do have knowledge of it, do I know whether my hermeneutic will withstand a test of time? Generally, the answer is no. Now, here is an example. Here's a statement where a scientist is saying, basically, we've settled this question. It's no longer even up for debate. We know that the issues of science and religion, of science and the they're settled. Why are you still talking about this? Uh, it is in this statement, this statement is filled with error. It begins with a premise that both philosophers and hard science scientists would disagree with. Anthropologists would disagree with the opening premise of this statement. Now, it could be made more true. We could make this statement more true or less wrong, 
depending upon how you want to say it in today's postmodern environment, by changing the phrase to say this, secular academics. Just change that to elite scientists. It would be a little more correct. Or if we just change it to scientists. John Polkinghorne, John Lennox, Alistair McGrath are just a few of a very significant portion of academia whose very discipline is to continually research how religion and science relate to each other. This issue is far from over. The debate is far from finished. As a matter of fact, many argue that trying to find the dividing line between science and religion is impossible. You will never know where one stops and the other begins. It is impossible to determine. So saying that this issue is settled is disingenuous, if not uninformed. Now, intellectual Darwinism has taken the ideas of Marx, Freud, Kant, and others, and they have developed and identified that religion or more specifically, Christianity, is the product of evolution itself. Intellectual Darwinism claims that religion arose entirely in the human mind, providing some benefit to the species at the time, but that benefit is no longer necessary. So, evolutionary thinking should now profess that religion is anti-beneficial. It needs to be removed from our culture. This very view has impacted how science is done. It has impacted the way that scientists conduct science. And it comes under many labels. It comes under the label of logical positivism, reductionism, and even more recently, as scientism. Now, scientists have attempted, and they continue to attempt, to define the line of demarcation to say, this is where science is, and this is where non-science is, and there's a very clear line between them. That very act is the application of the Darwinian view and the statement or the belief that the two are separable. It is a very modern belief. Their own scientism, their own belief, is not apparent to them. So when we're applying this hermeneutic, when you and I are looking at whether or not the universe is extremely old or extremely young, we're not looking at two separate sets of evidence. The young earth creationists don't have their little bag of evidence which they kind of build and grow and trying to make it big enough so that it finally overwhelms the evolutionists and the evolutionists have their little bag of evidence. We have the same evidence. We're both looking at it, whether we believe that the universe is extremely old or we believe the universe is extremely young, either one. The difference is our worldview and the application of our hermeneutics. So which of these is true? Isn't this really where we've come to? Is the universe 16 billion years old, or is it 6,000 years old? Now, each of these views are characterized by our culture. If you hold to a 16 billion year old view, then you're unbiased. You're simply speaking what is true and correct, what science has proved. You're not affected by any belief system. You're just speaking truth to us. And it's, it's based on proof. It's based on evidence. If, however, you believe the universe is young, about 6,000 years old, well, that's unscientific. You're just speaking dogma. This is a belief system. We can't trust you. That's unprovable, and it's unacceptable. This is a hermeneutic, two applications of two different hermeneutics, one saying, we're going to make this decision. Now, the question is, what do we do about that? 
Listen, I, I need to encourage the body of Christ in this way. I've got to take you all the way back to Genesis. I need to take you back to the Garden of Eden. And you need to understand that the issue of creation and evolution, if you are a Christian who holds to an old earth view, as I once did as a theistic evolutionist, if you are a Christian that holds to a young earth view, you need to know that this really goes back to who do you worship and what is your worship. Here's the problem. The problem is it's a crisis of authority. We see in the Genesis account of the coming of sin, a description of how sin came upon all of us, upon the human race. Now, often this is simply described and portrayed as a story, simply trying to tell us how it happened. There was a time before sin, and now there's a time of sin. Nothing more, just a story to show us that now we are in the time of sin. A story to describe something so that we can have some understanding of it. However, I want to encourage you that there is much, much more here than just a story. This is the very foundation of the question of how we can help ourselves and others. This is a tool we can use. So let's address the question of where are we? You ready? We're going to apply a worldview and a hermeneutics. Where are we? We're in a world filled with beings, people, and these beings and these people have chosen to worship at the altar of self. And they have chosen to reject, they have chosen to give proper and acceptable worship to the creator of all things. You know, it's kind of astounding how many issues today fall in that same thing. There was just a recent study that came out. Sorry, I just have to, I have to diverge for just a second. A recent study where they asked a group of Christians, given the opportunity, would you engage in sexual activity outside of marriage? And the response came back. 61% of the respondents said, absolutely, without question, yes, we would engage in deep sexual activity outside of the covenant of marriage. Now, the authors tried to explain that. But, but I can tell you it comes back down to who do you worship? You're worshiping at the altar of self? Or are you worshiping at the altar of God? It's a crisis of authority, just like this issue of creation and evolution is. This is a crisis of authority. God clearly, clearly established and taught us that He is the author. He's the authority. He's the source of truth. Where does truth come from? Does it come from our ability to reason, our ability to think, our ability as scientists to have a scientific process to say, behold, 16 billion years old? Or does it come from the author himself who says truth? It's a crisis of authority. And you and I, just like Adam and Eve, we have a choice to either accept or reject that. So what's going on here? What happened in the Garden of Eden? What happened when God said, you can eat of any tree that you want in the Garden of Eden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you cannot eat. Now let me just ask you a question. When did Adam and Eve become aware of good and evil? If you think it was after they ate, then you're missing the story entirely. Because God has already told them, I'm telling you what good and evil is. Good is obey me, eat from anything but this tree. Evil is disobey me, eat from the tree. They knew good and evil before they ever pulled the fruit off the tree. So what happened? What happened to them when they did so? Well, it says that Satan, in the form of a serpent, said to them, you'll not die. You'll be like God. Okay, what does that mean? Well, who's deciding what is good and bad? God is. Satan's saying, you can make that decision for yourself. Do you see now how much deeper this story is? And how it really does apply to you and I today? So, what are we deciding? That God's the author? He's the authority? Or do I get to decide? Does it belong to humans? Does it belong to scientists? 
Any of you recognize this picture? That's a great painting, the School of Athens. It's one of the most famous frescoes by the Italian Renaissance artist Raphael. It was painted between 1510 and 1511 as part of Raphael's commission to decorate frescoes in rooms that we now know as the Stanza de Raffaella, and it's in the Apostolic Palace in the Vatican. Now, these two pictures, there are two of them. Now, this is one on opposite walls. Um, on the opposite wall from this is the painting called the La Disputa, which happens to, to deal with the disputation of, of, the, of the bread that served during communion and whether or not it actually is transubstantiated, a very Catholic belief from the Roman Catholic Church. But I want to focus on two individuals in this picture, two individuals right in the middle. There's Plato on the left and Aristotle on the right. In this detail, we see that Aristotle is gesturing to the earth, representing his belief in empirical observation and experience, but Plato is gesturing towards the heaven. Plato believed that you could understand truth apart from experience. He taught that everything we saw down here was just a reflection of the truth that was present in some other realm. Aristotle said, no, 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 empiricism. Aristotle is the father of modern science. That's how far back this issue goes. It's way past Darwin, all the way back to the Greek philosophers. This foundation for empiricism would blossom during the Enlightenment. Let me show you two more individuals. So we've seen Aristotle and Plato. Watch what happens as we continue to move through our history. Now, Augustine and Rene Descartes. When Augustine was talking about how he came to know God and experience God, if you've ever read his confessions, he says that he came to know God through the very work of God, the revelation of God, the work of Jesus Christ. In his writings, he treats God as real, as personal, as there with reverence. He says, I only came to know God when I finally could understand I had to humble myself before the incredibly humble servant Jesus Christ. Now, Rene Descartes, we know him from I doubt, therefore I am. Maybe that statement. Uh, some people believe he said, I think, therefore I am. Uh, Descartes said this, I can't trust anything. Can't trust my eyes. I can't trust you. Can't trust my hearing. So let's just think that nothing is there. Now, when I put everything apart, I still have my thoughts. And in my thoughts, God exists. Therefore, there is a God. So he trusted himself. He is now the arbiter of right and wrong, of truth and meaning. Augustine says, no, 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 no. Truth and meaning, revelation comes from God. Two more examples. The two original scientists, Isaac Newton and Ibn al-Hathim. Now, Isaac Newton, we know for his work, which most Western scientists call the book which is the foundation of modern science, the Principia. In the Principia, he says this, this most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. And if the fixed stars are the centers of other like systems, these being formed by and with like counsel, they must be all subject to dominion of that one, especially since the light of the fixed stars is of the same nature, with the same light as our sun. And from every system, the light passes into all other systems. And lest the systems of the fixed stars should, by their gravity, fall onto one another, this same God hath placed these systems at immense distances one from another. This being governs all things, not as the soul of the world, but as Lord over all. And on account of his dominion, he is wont to be called Lord God, universal ruler, the father of modern science. Can you imagine that statement? A little later on, he makes this statement, God is known from his works. 
which is a, a, a restatement of Romans 120. God has revealed himself in his creation so that his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Now, even al he even made these confessions as a Muslim scientist many, many years before Isaac Newton. Here's a statement from him. I constantly sought knowledge and truth, and it became my belief that by gaining access to the effulgence and closeness of God, there is no better way than that of searching for truth and knowledge. Uh, Basically, he said this. You want to know truth? You want to know God? I'm, I'm sorry, you want to know knowledge? You want to know truth? Draw close to God. What an incredible and confrontational idea. So here we have the two worldviews. Methodological naturalism is what has come out of the Enlightenment all the way from Aristotle, all the way through Descartes, all the way through all of the philosophical systems, the scientism, and resulted in science today that denies the existence of the supernatural, that says that there is no God, there must be a natural explanation for everything. The contrary to that is biblical naturalism, that says, yes, there is God. He is not part of his nature. He's not part of what he has created. He is supernatural. He is preeminent in his revelation of truth, and he gives that to us through scripture. So the source of truth is not human reasoning. It is scripture itself. There are real people, Adam and Eve, the first historical people, and this world that God created was destroyed by a catastrophe. So the two worldviews, methodological naturalism and biblical naturalism, are the two worldviews of science that we see today, and young earth creationism is dominated by the biblical naturalism, evolution by methodological naturalism. That's the worldview. How did we get here? What happened? The beginning of modern science that we can trace all the way back to 600 BC, the scientific method began with this confession that truth trumped reason, that truth was always preeminent, that nothing I could think of or reason through or logically think about would trump what was revealed to us through the very revelation that God gave us. Now, during the Greek influence, that started to get messed up a little bit. Truth and reason were seen as the same. I could reason my way to an understanding of truth. And by the time of the Enlightenment, by the time of Descartes, Faith was broken out as a separate area. Do you notice that not until then is faith seen as something other than truth and reason? And by the time that we get even to the modern era, now methodological naturalism is denying the very existence of faith. Ah, it's just a hangover from evolution. That's just something that evolved. There's a meme that's just bringing that along. Eventually it will die out. And then postmodernism today is even saying, ah, we're not even sure truth exists. Only rationality. That's the world in which scientists are making truth claims apart from any knowledge of their worldview or the hermeneutic they're using. So this is what's happened. We went from a world in which truth was was preeminent over human reason to give us understanding and knowledge Uh, to today where human reason is seen as preeminent over truth and actually is the source of truth of understanding and knowledge. Why is that bad? Because there's bias there. Unacknowledged bias. Let me show you just one example. I have great respect for Stephen Hawking. I believe he's a brilliant man and has done great work for us. But look at this quote, if you will. He has lived with the prospect of death for at least 49 years. And notice how he describes death. It's just the brain's a computer. It stops working. There's no heaven. There's no afterlife. Just a broken down computer. Stephen Hawking is unaware that he suffers from a perspective of being in the well. He's so deep in the well of science, he has no ability to see the horizon. All he can see is up the sides of the well. No awareness of the horizon. No awareness in this statement of any other disciplines and their contributions to truth. Because even though he's saying 
that the brain is a computer and that death is just breaking the computer and my denial of the supernatural is proof that it doesn't exist, none of these are true. Not a single one of those statements is rational. Yet we allow him to make that statement and we make it, allow him to do that without any kind of, of discussion. Now here's another one by Richard Dawkins. And notice what he says here. Evolution's a fact. Beyond reasonable doubt, beyond serious doubt, beyond sane, informed, intelligent doubt, beyond doubt, evolution is a fact. The evidence for evolution is at least as strong as the evidence for the Holocaust. Even allowing for eyewitnesses to the Holocaust, no reputable science, scientist disputes it, and no unbiased reader will close the book doubting it. Is that true? I mean, this is what Richard Dawkins is saying. He's saying, if you believe in six days of creation of a young universe, that it's only about 6,000 years old, that you deny that the Holocaust ever happened, that Rome never existed, that history began only, you know, 200 years ago. He has as much as said that. Was well, that a rational statement? Let's go back to his statement one more time. And let me just simply replace a few words. That's all I'm going to do. This is just a tool to see if his logical argument makes sense. You ready? Here we go. Geocentrism is a fact. Beyond reasonable doubt, beyond serious doubt, beyond sane, informed, intelligent doubt, beyond doubt, the earth is at the center of the universe. It's a fact. The evidence for geocentrism is at least as strong as the evidence for the existence of the Pope, even allowing for eyewitnesses of the Pope. No reputable science disputes it, and no unbiased reader will close the book doubting it. It's simply the fact that I've made a logical argument, rational proof of that truth. No, because we know that the Earth is not at the center of the universe or the solar system. The sun is. That is a known thing. Okay, so rational argument isn't the source of truth. What is? Facts are. So let's look at some facts, shall we? Now, I've got to warn you, facts are the result of a worldview. And the application of that worldview in pulling out of these facts truth is hermeneutics. So if we look at ice cores, for example... Evolutionists hold that, now this is a picture of an ice core. You can see the layers that are in here. Evolutionists hold that these layers, the methodological naturalists, will hold that these layers all represent annual seasonal cycles. So if I count them up, I have the evidence for at least 800,000 years of Earth's history. Yet as a biblical naturalist, the only thing I can tell you is that a layer is equal to a layer. That's all I really know. Now, I can presuppose or I can maybe think that they might be simply a fact, an artifact of taking snow and compressing it, that it will form these layers during that process, or that the layers are storm events, not seasonal events. I could have several hot and cold events throughout an annual cycle, and so even though I might think that these represent one year, it might be that one year is even 10 to 20 or maybe even 100 of these. So which of them is true? It depends on your worldview and your hermeneutic. What about the carbon-14 in diamonds? Now we should not find carbon-14 in diamonds. Carbon-14 should only be around for about 60,000 years and then it disappears. But in diamonds, the carbon are all stuck in there in this three-dimensional matrix. It can't move in or out. So any carbon that's in a diamond had to be there when the diamond was formed. Methodological naturalism says that all the carbon is original. If there is any carbon-14, it has to be a contaminant. There can't be any other possible explanation for it because we know that these diamonds have to be one to three million years old. Well, how do you know that they're, they're old? Well, because they have to be. Anything younger than that doesn't fit our worldview. Biblical naturalism says, wait a minute, I find carbon-14. Even when I'm very meticulous in removing every source of contamination, I still find significant amounts of carbon-14, which tells me these diamonds have to be less than that 60,000-year-old age. So which of these is correct? Which of the facts will we follow? Which of them is useful to us? That depends on if we understand our hermeneutics and our worldview. How about one more? 
the island of Surtsey, Iceland. I, again, I need to tell you where we are. So this is Greenland over here, the one with all the ice on it. And this is Iceland up here, the one with all the green on it. If we zoom in to, Greenland, uh, to Iceland, and we look down here off the bottom of the coast, we discover that there is a brand new island down here, the island of Surtsey. Now, before 1967, actually 1963, there was no island of Surtsey. We know when the island of Surtsey finally broke through the surface of the ocean, 1963. It continued to erupt until 1967 when the island reached a size of approximately one square mile. Now, this image that you're seeing here is from the November 21st, 1963 initial eruptions, when it was already approximately 120 feet above sea level. Now, geologists visiting the island of Surtsey after 1967 were astonished at the geological structures that were already apparent. Here are some of the structures that they saw. Notice the layering and the erosion of the layering and all of the rubble that is down here from that process. It looks like it's thousands of years old, maybe tens of thousands. And here is a volcanic layer on top of volcanic tuff, again with many, many, many layers in it. Now, S. Thorensen, he's an evolutionary geologist, he made this observation. Well, anywhere else on the surface of the Earth, this formation would have taken thousands of years to develop, but not here on Surtsey. It just takes a couple of days, maybe a few weeks. He is unable to see the fact that he has a worldview which says that there must be accelerated age processes here. That's the only thing that can explain that it's not normal, it's not representative, because we can't handle a young age. But as a biblical naturalist, age, it's a rapid thing. It appears rapidly. We need to rescale our age indicators. Everywhere else we look on the earth, based on what we see at Surtsey, we need to understand that the deep age time scale is incorrect. That's a rational thought process. You remember this slide? Let me ask it to you a different way. Which of these is correct? You know one comes back from the dead. There's no such thing as a resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and remains alive today. Now, we as Christians will readily accept the resurrection but deny that God could create the world 6,000 years ago in six literal days. You need to understand that science views both of those the same. If you hold to a resurrection, you are unrealistic. You're biased. You hold to a dogma. You have a belief system that's unprovable and unacceptable. So why do we need a different hermeneutic when it comes to the age of the earth? Is it because we, we just don't know how old the earth is? Or we don't think it matters? Whom do you worship? This is a crisis of authority. Here's my agenda. I want you to believe the word of God. I want to encourage you that in believing the word of God, you can stand on the truth. And by standing on the truth, you can live to glorify Him.